Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Let's run through our review for chapter 25. This was dealing with environmental uh, microbiology. Our um, little review here is not going to be very long <laughs> because it wasn't a particularly long chapter. And I felt like it was mostly like detail on stuff that you wouldn't particularly need to be reminded about um, so much as it is a little bit of common knowledge and um, just retention. So um, anyways, we talked about um, the cycles, the, the geo uh, chemical or um, bio biochemical cycles. Um, anyways, uh, one of those molecules that we talked about being recycled in our ecosystems would be the carbon cycle. And um, we talked about the importance of photosynthesis in this role. So having atmospheric carbon dioxide being taken up by things that are photosynthetic like plants, and then they will fix the carbon dioxide in that inorganic form into an organic form um, in the form of a sugar, like typically glucose. And then they can use it for energy or like we can go or to build their cells up and the, the parts of their cells. Um, and then we can go and eat them. And then that cycles that carbon into us as we eat um, the sugars and other molecules that have carbon in them. Um, and then we will go and die and then saprobes will go ahead and eat us. And then, um, you know, whatever, uh, that will cycle that some of that carbon back into that and then they can die and eat each other and whatever. But ultimately while all of that dying and eating is happening, um, whether it was us or whether it was the saprobes, we're, uh, performing aerobic respiration and that's going to release carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. And that's how the cycle is going to go, um, rotating back through. Turns out that methane is a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is, and it seems to be largely produced by the cattle industry, as well as our methanogens that are in our anaerobic swamps. Then we had uh, nitrogen. Um, we had nitrogen. Um, we talked about soil biology in general and nitrogen fixation and incorporating nitrogen into the roots of um, plants. Uh, essentially a symbiotic relationship where the plant is providing energy to the microbe, the bacterium, and then um, the bacterium is providing um, nutrients, including ni nitrogen in a form the plant can use back to the plant, which the plant can't do that on its own. So it requires the microbes to do that. So if it's too hot for the microbes to grow, then it will be too hot um, for the microbes that grow that provide nitrogen to the plants. Um, and the pl plants can't grow because they can't grow without the um, bacteria. And this is actually a real problem. That's why I'm bringing it up because it seems like certain areas of the world will be more likely to experience this relatively soon. Um, probably everybody over a given time if things continue the way that it, they do. Um, but uh, yeah, they're going to starve probably within our lifetime. People I'm talking about. So um, in certain areas of the world. So uh, Right. So we also talked about different other ways that you can convert um, nitrogen that is from our, the, uh, the environment and convert it into different forms and all that stuff. Uh, we have uh, the organisms that are going to be involved in ammonification. So literally just um, decomposing things and creating ammonia as a byproduct. Then we have nitrification. Nitrification is essentially taking the um, ammonia ions um, and then converting it into nitrite and nitrate. And then we have denitrification, which will be um, taking the ammonia ions and turning it essentially through many steps. We have nitrates and nitrites involved in there, but many steps into um, N2, which is the um, N2 di dinitrogen, which is going to be atmospheric nitrogen. So ni nitrogen gas that makes up most of our atmosphere. So that is the cycles of um, nitrogen. Then we have marine microbes. Um, we talked about all different um, environments, including uh, saltwater and freshwater and um, hyper saline, which was talking about the Dead Sea. So it was high, high salt concentrations. Even um, there are even microbes there. Those were our um, halophiles or our archaea, our extremophiles, right? And um, all of that. And then we talk about plastic and how plastic can create like rafts, essentially. They say reefs, um, but whatever, the microbes can stick onto these reefs and um, grow where they shouldn't be able to grow. And this can also, the plastic itself, as well as the growth on the plastic on the surface of the oceans, which 88% um, of Earth's oceans are covered in um, that microplastic stuff. 
Um, anyways, um, yeah, so um, that can lead to blocking the sun to organisms that are um, lower down that would not be able to, would normally be able to get the sunlight, uh, but now they're not able to. Um, and that can create problems as well as just plastic being bad for the organisms themselves, whether it's getting caught in your pop can um, holders or whatever it is. Um, then we have uh, water filtration, which, you know, essentially we were talking about literal filtration of water before it comes to your house um, and treating it with, um, you know, whether it's UV or ozone or a chlorine product of some kind um, before it comes to your house. And then wastewater treatment, because in a lot of these um, um, less advantaged countries, they don't have the ability to deal with their waste properly. So they're just dumping sewage back into the water that people are washing their clothes and using for drinking and all that sort of stuff. So, um, so we have to be able to remove um, the solid materials will allow for uh, removal of solid materials and skimming that sort of stuff off um, and then coagulation of things um, and settling of sludge and breaking down the sludge by the uh, other microbes that can break that down into finer particles. And then we can um, filter everything out and um, keep as much of the liquid as we can, hopefully. Um, and then so we'll filter that and then treat it. Um, with again, chlorine or something like that, and then release it back into the environment, much, much safer, much cleaner than just straight up sewage into the environment. And how do we actually keep track of, are we removing enough stuff? Are we actually removing enough of the bad microbes? Um, so we keep track of uh, this by monitoring coliforms and these can be fecal coliforms. Um, these uh, would include uh, E. coli and others. Uh, that if they grow, if we're filtering the water of whatever we thought we cleaned um, and they grow up on our um, Petri dish or whatever, then uh, that indicates that other organisms that would be very bad for us could potentially be growing in there as well. So we don't necessarily look for those organisms specifically, but if we get fecal coliforms growing, we're going to assume that the other bad guys could be there too. Um, we also use microbes for food preparation. We uh, talked a little bit about fermentation. Um, and the importance in bread and beer. We also use it for wine, pickling, dairy, yogurt, and cheese. Um, and then we have uh, food food safety. We didn't really talk um, too much about that, but I will tell you guys as far as food safety goes, since it's on here, <laughs> this did not have really to do with this chapter um, in this circumstance, but um, I will tell you freezing and uh, refrigerating isn't gonna kill anything, by the way. Um, but yeah, so you guys won't be tested on that one. That one was from the um, old, oh, that one was from the old um, chapter before the textbook was edited. So I apologize for that. Um, so you don't need to worry about food safety. Well, you need to worry about it. Just not on this, this part, not for this chapter of understanding, getting quizzed on. Okay. I'm not getting quizzed on food safety for this don't rely on refrigeration or freezing to kill microbes. It will not do. You put them in the freezer, you get them back out, you thaw your stuff out, you're getting ready to grow or to cook your um, chicken. As assume the same amount of salmonella on that chicken as there was before you put it in the freezer. Okay. Um, and then we talked about effects of society and climate on disease persistence and emergent re-emergence of these diseases um, and the one health concept, the one health concept being that all organisms and all health, the health of all organisms on the entire planet are intertwined, at least in somehow. And that's like goes back to that concept of the butterfly effect, which is not an untrue uh, concept. That's actually a very true concept. That um, yes, it's it's not as simple as butterfly flaps its wings in China and now there's rain in New York. It's um, more or less like because it flapped its wings and I saw it and then I went decided to go to the bathroom at this time and then um, you know because I drank that water that day it led to the you know climate whatever, all these different little steps that lead to that right. It's not A to B. It's just all these little steps in between. So that's what this is talking about as far as the effect on climate, on disease and the reemergence of these diseases and how it relates to other organisms and everything on the planet um, all as one. So that is the end of uh, chapter 25's review and I will see you guys for the next one.